Waste your time. She's leaving time. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm too late. I know I'm too late. I know I'm too late. I know I'm 50 years late. <laughs>
Peace be with you gathered here and with you worshiping online. Wherever we are, we are one body in Christ. I'm so glad to be with you this morning. Let us prepare to worship God. Please rise in body or in spirit and join me in the call to worship using the words printed in your bulletin. The Lord rules. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all the peoples behold his glory. Light dawns for the righteous, and joy for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, and may give thanks to his holy name. Let us worship and exalt our God. Now let's sing together the opening hymn, number 233 in your hymnal, The Day of Resurrection.
The author of 1 John said, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from every unrighteousness. With that confidence before God, let us pray together. Merciful God, in your gracious presence, we confess our sin and the sin of this world. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. The profit and pleasures we pursue lay waste the land and pollute the seas. The fears and jealousies that we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. We abuse your good gifts of imagination and freedom, of intellect and reason, and turn them into bonds of oppression. Lord, have mercy upon us, heal and forgive us, set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love in Jesus Christ. Amen. We have confessed our sin as a community of faith and as priests for the whole world. In silence, let us admit our individual sin to God. Hear this good news again. The author of 1 John said, If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, who is the atoning sacrifice not only for our sins, but for those of the whole world. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. As reconciled and reconciling people, let us now pass the peace to each other, saying, The peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ be with you. What did you guys have for breakfast this morning? Biscuits and bacon. At our house, we usually have waffles on Sundays. It's <laughs> but you know, there are people that don't have breakfast, and it's because they can't, they don't have enough money to, let's say, they either have to put gas in their car or they can have breakfast. They have to decide. So every every month we take y'all take around these little things and people put money in them and we use that money to help people buy breakfast or lunch or dinner. So 
I'd like y'all to help me. You can have one, and you can have one, and here, I'll let you take that. Wow, you guys did a really good job. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, now we'll take just say a little prayer. Dear God, thank you for letting us help other people. In Jesus' name, amen.
As we approach God's word, let us pray for the spirit to illumine our hearts and minds. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. God of mystery, reveal yourself to us and show us your gracious purpose for our lives. As scripture is read and proclaimed, and we will give you glory through Christ who makes you known. Amen. Our first scripture reading today is Psalm 133. Listen for the word of God. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
What a lovely anthem. Thank you so much. The second reading comes from 2 Corinthians. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything has passed away. Look, new things have come into being. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. For our sake, God made the one who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we work together with him, we entreat you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. <clears throat> Look, now is the acceptable time. Look, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's, in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way in great endurance, afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, in purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and look, we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children, open wide your hearts also. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let's begin this morning with a reminder about two parts of speech, namely the metaphor and the simile. You recall that a metaphor is a comparison that says one thing is some other thing. I am a rock. I am an island, goes the old Simon and Garfunkel song. Now I am become death the destroyer of worlds, said Robert Oppenheimer, quoting the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. This bread is my body. This wine is my blood, said Jesus at the Last Supper. A simile, on the other hand, says a thing is like another. Sometimes this way of speaking becomes hard to understand because similes might be based in experiences of people and cultures that others may not share. Chubby Checker sang this musical invitation. Let's twist again like we did last summer. But to understand his meaning, you would first have to know that the twist was a dance. And even if you knew that, unless you ran with the crowd twisting last summer and saw them dancing or did it yourself, you would still not be totally clear on what he meant. A couple of similes from my college days and childhood come to mind. I remember a first and only date with a young woman from the Campus Crusade for Christ group we were both involved with at the University of Georgia. She and I were walking back to the car after a movie and the weather was balmy and a little breezy. And I said to her, this is just like a beach at night. She had no idea what I meant and said so. Boy, was I embarrassed to be so unable to communicate. I guess I assumed, since she was from Georgia, 
and she was a Christian. She had also been on a church youth retreat in high school to Panama City Beach, Florida, where people sat outside in the evening talking, enjoying the ocean breeze. The other comparison comes from the times I misbehaved as a child. Daddy would say, boy, you better straighten up or I'm going to be on you like white on rice. <laughs> At other times, the threat was like a duck on a June bug. White on rice, maybe I got. But I had no idea at the time what a June bug was or how or why a duck would attack it. The general sense, I suppose, was his punishment would be swift and without warning. But surely, surely one of the most incomprehensible comparisons we could hear is found in the psalm for the day, probably made so puzzling by the difference in culture and religion between us and the ancient Israelites. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down upon the beard of Aaron. It is like the dew of Hermon. You know, it's like twisting on a beach on a summer night while the duck pounces on a June bug. <laughs> Here's where we all quote the Disney movie line. I don't know what that means. What could the author possibly have in mind? We'd like to know if he has some special insight into how humans can live together in harmony or how co-workers can get along or churches can somehow move beyond suspicion and brokenness and get on with ministry. We know very well how the lines of gender and class and creed and nationality and age and viewpoint and lifestyle and on and on and on ad nauseum divide us. They separate us from those whom Jesus urged us to consider our neighbors. We talk past each other, we eye each other warily, we watch our backs lest we get stabbed literally or figuratively when we're not looking. It seems sometimes, doesn't it, as if people live on different planets, alternate Earths, with languages, customs, and sets of facts that have no common reference point. The line that appears on so many divorce papers could describe our plight on this planet, in this nation, in our organizations, in the church far too often. Two words, irreconcilable differences, irretrievable breakdown. Help, the Beatles said. I need somebody, help me, please. And that's our cry as well. But is this obscure text the place to look for aid? Obviously I think so since I chose it from several options in today's lectionary. Maybe the very strangeness of its imagery can break open some new insights for us. So let's see if we can figure out the poet's basic point. I think he's saying that people living in harmony is a good and wonderful thing. And by implication, the alternative, well, it's not so desirable. He thus rejects warfare and bickering and name calling and rivalry and taking revenge. But a community that lives with getting along as its goal, that strives to heal the hurts and bring people together, oh, well, that's something to sing about, to celebrate. Maybe the thought of such a celebration of something good led the writer to reflect on times when the community especially came together with joy and harmony. 
And surely one of those occasions would be the ordination of the high priest, the chief religious officer of the people. Oh, there's hope for change in the air. The future seems bright and full of promise. A people who had to think every day about how to save money and make do could suddenly become extravagant. Oil was a precious commodity usually reserved for essential functions like heating and cooking and putting oil, uh, putting and providing fuel for lamps. But when a priest was ordained, the liquid was poured over his head in great quantity. It ran down over his beard and onto his robes. Wasted. Gone. For this short time, the space of a few hours, a group of people who always had tomorrow on their minds could concentrate on the joy of the moment. They could act on faith that God would provide what they needed. Knowing that God was watching over them, they could afford to be, they could choose to be generous. The other image due on the mountains has a similar reference to blessing. In an arid land like Israel, any moisture was welcome and needed. Dew was a gift from the hand of Almighty God who took care of his own and all creation. Water and well-being were synonymous. What the poet wants to say about unity and harmony begins to become clear. A community that lives in peace is one convinced of the blessing of God. It depends on God more than its own efforts. People that are sure God will provide can reach out their hands in friendship to each other because accepting someone who is different cannot threaten anyone who is in God's care. Scholar Walter Brueggemann describes the life of such a community as unguarded, careless, and generous. He observes a community at peace is one with more than enough. By contrast, when folk are frightened, when they have little confidence that their needs are going to be provided for, when the whole world seems to be crashing down around their heads, they exhibit the classic response, they flee or they fight. Their language is filled with references to us and them, with slurs against people from other races or religions or languages, another gender or some distant spot across the globe, all the isms and phobias that we cling to in our day. They think primarily about how to build barriers instead of bridges, where they can get the emotional or physical armor plate to protect themselves instead of the dinner plates to share a meal. They must find an enemy. Indeed, their whole identity depends on having an enemy against which to define themselves. A culture war against that or, or against this or a holy crusade against that, a, a group to blame or an incident to exploit. For all its might, it's the authoritarian or the totalitarian system that's really insecure. It must ignore and suppress basic human rights and undermine or destroy institutions that support those rights in order to maintain its hold. Such dynamics operate even in and among those in our nation claiming to be godly, to have a so-called biblical worldview, to follow Jesus. Have you noticed 
no matter how large their congregations, how loud their voices in the media, how protected their privilege, and how profound and consequential their influence in legislatures and courts. There are those calling themselves Christians who feel threatened by a different viewpoint. Whether it's that of other people of faith or the growing number of those who profess no particular belief. These self-styled Christians complain about persecution because, of course, unless with governmental and societal sanction you can force your extremist doctrines and practices on everyone, unless you can control their every thought, monitor their every conversation, dictate their every action, unless you can do all that, you are being persecuted. They demand cultural props and laws to support the house of cards that is their belief system because such faith can't withstand the probing questions of reasonable people influenced by science or guided by common sense. Pull out one brick. Oh, and the whole building comes tumbling down. For example, an inerrant, infallible Bible whispered by God into the ears of the writers. I'm not making this up. I'm citing a real belief I recall from my years as a fundamentalist. I think of Pastor Dan from my youth citing historical evidence of Roman methods of execution, a teacher in a Sunday school class at First Presbyterian Church in Albany, Georgia, said that when Jesus was crucified, the spikes were put through his wrists. And when he heard that, Pastor Dan immediately became distressed and objected, what does that do to our Bible? It says his hands. For Dan, the whole of Scripture had to be literally, historically true, every detail absolutely accurate, or nothing in it was true in any sense. And so many, too many in our day agree. But when your existence is that precarious, you see everybody as an enemy, even members of your own family, in this case, the family of faith. You're constantly afraid something or someone is going to bring down that carefully constructed edifice of doctrine and practice. Such fear is the greatest threat to harmony and unity. That's why the biblical writers sometimes said, fear, not hate, is the opposite of love. The Apostle Paul certainly knew something about people living with a fear and anger that led to con conflict and disharmony. He wrote to a group of people who were constantly fighting each other. It's interesting to look at the church in Corinth as a kind of case study in human relationships. These were people so filled with rage that they were blinded to their own inadequacies. Their conversations had become shouting matches filled with slogans when they spoke at all. They argued about everything. Food, sex, church government, worship services, spiritual gifts, their favorite preacher, the church budget, and how much to give to missions. Paul penned four letters to them, 
now cobbled together by the editors of the New Testament as 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Oh, he tried hard to sort everything out, but nothing seemed to work. And probably Paul got blamed by a number of the members for all their problems. Certainly we know his reputation was trashed over and over again by some powerful people in the church. Finally, he simply said, as we heard, folks, I love you. My heart is open wide to you. Is it too much to ask that you treat me the same way? Paul's appeal to his troubled church makes a fundamental point about human relationships that get into trouble especially relationships between people of faith, whatever their beliefs and traditions may be. It's just this. There are never just two partners in a fight, us and them, you and me. There's always a third, namely God. You see, when we fail to be reconciled to each other, we are also separated from God whose heart breaks at the mess we're in and who longs to hold us close or at least to hear us speak again in civil, courteous tones. Siblings in Christ, it won't do to claim you or I love God or follow Jesus when we can't get along with each other in the nation, the community, the church, the workplace, or the family. The way we live, not what we say we believe, the way we live is an index of our commitment to the gospel that calls us to peace. It shows how dependent we are on the God who is able to provide for our needs. Remember, it's people who believe their survival is threatened, who can't and won't welcome another. But oh, when we're secure in the knowledge and love of God, we're open to the gifts that others may give. We're free to love our neighbors as ourselves, as Jesus taught us to be hospitable and seek understanding when we know that our lives, along with all others on earth, are sustained not by our efforts, but by the God who sends the dew upon the mountains, we begin to give up our claims of, to power over others, our efforts to control, our insistence on our own agendas. And just maybe we take steps to break the cycle of defensiveness and fear. When we do that, Others will give up their claims as well. And then we can begin to work and to live for a larger common good, namely the day when all humankind will know the blessed extravagance of reconciliation, the oil on Aaron's beard. In the name of the creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we affirm our faith using a portion of the Confession of 1967 Inclusive Language Version. Let us say what we believe. We believe that God the Holy Spirit fulfills the work of reconciliation. The Holy Spirit creates and renews the church as a community in which we are reconciled to God and to one another. The Spirit enables us to receive forgiveness as we forgive one another and to enjoy the peace of God as we make peace among ourselves. We believe that in spite of our sin, the Holy Spirit gives us power to become representatives of Jesus Christ and proclaim the good news of reconciliation to all.
Please be seated. As at other times when I've uh, filled in for Natalie, during the prayers of the people, you will, rather than my taking prayer requests now, during the prayers of the people, you will have uh, an opportunity to lift up your request and your thanksgiving, your prayers of intercession and thanksgiving during the prayer. And the cue for that will be very clear. Let us pray. Great and gracious God, our creator, we give you praise for the presence of your spirit in and among us, convicting of sin, confirming truth, calling to ministry, conveying peace, calming doubt and fear. We rejoice with all the church and our risen Lord who has given us the spirit, breathing new life into our discipleship and transforming our darkness into glorious light. Hear our prayers for ourselves and others today. We ask your care for all in need today, those who are marginalized and excluded, who suffer loss from the ravages of nature, who are hungry, who are victims of war or crime or injustice, who are afraid, sick, troubled, doubting, lonely, grieving. Particularly do we bring you our neighbors friends and families whose names are printed on our prayer list each week and imprinted always on our hearts. We pray that we may move, we may prove to be faithful as the body of Christ to be his hands to touch and heal, his voice to comfort, his feet to go out in mission to the world you love. Hear now these prayers of intercession and thanksgiving your people lift up. I invite you to Bring your prayers. Prayers for successful surgery for Nina this week. Press the people of Ukraine. And we thanks to God that I will allow the recovery and surgery. Thanksgiving for the voices of children. The psalmist of old celebrated the blessedness of unity and our Lord Jesus prayed that his own might be one. We pray that you will help all people of goodwill work for harmony and discord and wholeness in places of brokenness in our land, our churches, our communities, our families. May honest conversations, authentic caring and unselfish action bring solutions to the many problems of our day in the church at large and in congregations of every expression of our faith. Help us despite differences to work together in mission, to find common ground, to celebrate your presence in our diversity. Grant that one day we may gather around a common table, share one ministry and welcome all whom you have called. We thank you for hearing our prayers and helping us turn them into action for your glory and for the furthering of your kingdom through Jesus, our risen Savior, who taught us to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Apostle Paul said, Freely have you received, also freely give. Let us worship God as we present our offering. Everything we have and are belongs to you, creating and sustaining God. We claim nothing as our own. We give you these offerings as the fruit of our labor and the sign of our commitment as stewards in your world. Take them, we pray, and use them to meet the need of this world for hope, healing, and harmony. Through Christ we pray, and all the people said, Amen. Amen. The hymn is number 236, The Strife is O'er.
Please be seated. Now time for announcements for, for uh, about mission and the life of the community. <clears throat> Carol, can you tell if uh, the parishes are online? They are. It's Bill Parrish's birthday. I'd like it if we could sing him happy birthday. It's also Wendy's birthday. Oh, happy birthday. <laughs> 93 for Bill. Hey, and mine is the Beatles song, When I'm 64. <laughs> <laughs> now just two because Wendy did one okay um, today we are starting the sacred earth and sacred soul Martha McAlpin will be leading the adult Sunday school class um, very interesting read and if you haven't read it that's fine because we'll catch you up um, it's really really a good good read um, so that is today after fellowship time we will be meeting in the library the adult library um, my second thing is on Saturday, this Saturday, is the International Fiesta. And you don't want to miss it, because it's great entertainment. We've actually wrote a grant to get professional performers to come, one of which is Tim Gordon, our bagpiper. And he's going to lead the parade of flags. So that's really exciting. Um, and then, of course, we always have that wonderful food. And on stage, there'll be other performers and booths set up to explain people's country. So it's a great day from 11 till 3. Um, you don't want to miss it. It's great. Thanks. I second everything Joan said about International Fiesta. It's the best day of the year in Starkville. Um, I also, another great day in Starkville is going to be April 16th at 3 o'clock in the afternoon in the Grant Library Auditorium where Institute for Humanities, yay? Yay! yay. Where there's going to be an Institute for Humanities event um, uh, about all things space, science, astrophysics, and how they affect us as humans, and how the way we see the night sky affects us as humans. Um, it will be featuring Dr. Angel Tanner and Dr. Alex Huey. Um, Dr. Tanner's an astrophysicist, Dr. Huey is an historian of science, um, and like most uh, institute events, it's more of a conversation than a presentation. So bring your questions and the topics you'd like to share. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, hearing none, once again, it's been great to be with you today. I look forward to an, my next visit at some time in the future. According to the Gospel of John on the evening of the first Easter day, Jesus said to his disciples, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Go out now then as they did to share the good news of God's love to all. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love today and always. Alleluia. Amen. Amen.